Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to our video lecture for Chapter 20, Phylogeny. This is a super important chapter, and it's also a particularly relevant chapter in modern biology. We'll see why that is later in this video. So we begin with a picture. So in Chapter 19, I showed you this image from one of Darwin's notebooks, where he says, I think, and he has a, a cladogram drawn. Um, this is a, an image that some really cool people have gotten tattooed on themselves. Um, some just have the, the I think part. All the ones in this picture have the I think and the, the cladogram. Um, what this image says, so it says I think, this part right here says case must be that one generation then should be as many living as now. To do this and to have many species in same genus as is requires extinction. This bottom part here is the part that I think is the most relevant. It says thus between A and B, immense gap of relation, C and B, the finest gradation, B and D, rather greater distinction, thus genera or genuses would be formed, bearing relation to ancient types with several extinct forms for, and it goes on. So he's saying in his little uh, cladogram, B and C are closely related, um, A and B pretty distant, but not as distant as say D compared to B. So this image is, um, sort of like a modern tree of life. Take a minute and find yourself on this tree, you're right here. Most of the things on this tree are all single cell, really, honestly all of it single cell, except for some of the things over here. Um, this is another tree of life that a scientist created a while ago. Um, each of these lines represents a, a current species and this shows less than 1% of the known species that are, are, are depicted in this diagram. This is also a, a tattoo that some people get tattooed on themselves. Um, I'm not sure about the foot placement, but you know, to each his own. Okay, so this chapter is mainly about how we create these diagrams called cladograms and how you interpret them. And I want to begin just at the beginning with, with an example. So this is a cladogram from your book, and you can see there's five species. Um, the x-axis would be time, and this would be the present. This would be back in time over here. Um, we have the eastern glass lizard, monitor lizard, iguanas, snakes, and geckos. Two of these things do not have legs. Um, the eastern glass lizard is a legless lizard, and snakes don't have legs, right? These three do have legs. And what this cladogram is showing, and let me just say real quick, cladograms could be wrong. There could be more than one way to depict evolutionary uh, relationships. Um, there's sort of like a, a hypothesis as to how things are related. So this, you know, this might not be correct. This is just one that was created, say, using DNA evidence. Um, you would think that snakes and legless lizards would be next to each other, as in they would have a recent common ancestor because they've lost their legs. But this one shows something different. This one shows the ancestor of all these that had legs, all right? And these two purple lines represent places where the legs got lost. So on the line toward the glass lizard, the legs got lost. And the line toward snakes, the legs got lost, all right? That had to happen twice in the way this cladogram is pictured. If I had legless lizards here and snakes here, I could have just lost it here, and that would have taken care of both of them. But because I have them on different sections of the cladogram, you had to have two events that happen. And what that is showing you is that legless lizards and snakes evolved separately or independently in that they lost their legs separately. So it wasn't like their ancestor didn't have legs. Their ancestors did have legs and they lost it, okay? Um, being able to interpret these cladograms, like for example, if I ask you, does this thing have legs or not have legs? Obviously the image says it has legs, but you should be able to tell that the ancestor had legs and it was lost on the line towards snakes and lost on the line towards the eastern glass lizard. This is just a bigger image of it. So a couple of vocabulary words, phylogeny, that's probably a new word for you. So phylogeny just means the evolutionary history of a species or group of, of related species. Phylogeny is basically trying to, to classify things based upon their evolutionary relatedness. Um, you could use DNA, you could use proteins, you could use um, what they look like, you could use behaviors, maybe like, I guess you could use bird, bird calls if you wanted to, usually you use DNA, right? Systematics is the discipline that strives to classify organisms and determines their evolutionary relationships. Basically, it's the science of doing phylogeny. And taxonomy, like we said in chapter 
um, 19, which is the science of classification, of naming things. Um, we mentioned Linnaeus in the previous chapter. He's the guy who came up with binomial nomenclature, the, the two named or two part naming system where you have the genus and then the species. Specific epithet is just the word species comes from the word specific because it's the most exclusive. It's the small things that is the one that has the least number of things in the in the classification scheme. Um, humans is Homo sapiens, a zebra is Equus zebra. So the genus name for a zebra is Equus, which also includes horses, like the word equestrian. The species is just zebra. Um, so a zebra contains fewer things than Equus contains. So the classification scheme, um, when you know, the broadest group, the domain, when I was in high school, we didn't have domains, we just had kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We said King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Um, for, for really good reasons, which we'll see later, we added the domain. Um, so you can say, did King Philip come over for good spaghetti? Um, it's up to you. But as you go down, you're getting more exclusive. As you go up, you're getting more inclusive. There's only three domains. So within a domain, there's kingdoms. Within kingdoms, there's phylums. You get the idea. Um, just to give an example, um, this just shows the classification. I have it listed here for a dolphin and for a human. Don't memorize this. This is just to do an example. So you go in a dolphin, same domain, same kingdom, same phylum, same class. You diverge from a dolphin at the order level. Dolphins are cetaceans, which are mammals that live in the ocean, and you're a primate. Um, for humans, the family is hominidae. Those include things like um, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, species of, of human-like things that are now extinct. You're the only hominid on planet Earth today. In the past, there was more than one, though. It's interesting. They live, like humans and Neanderthals live together. They actually interbred. Um, genus Homo uh, species sapiens. The further back two species diverge, the least related they are. So like you and a plant are both in eukarya, you diverge at the kingdom level. They're obviously in kingdom planting. Um, you and a chimp diverge um, at the family. Um, you and a chimp are both primates, you diverge in the family, okay? So if you were given something like this on the AP exam, you should be able to answer questions about it. So the word taxon, these are all taxa. Um, T-A-X-A is the plural. It just means a, a, a level of classification. And one thing to point out, I have it on the slide, um, an order of snails has less genetic diversity than an order of mammals. So not all orders are created equal. Some orders have lots of things in and some orders have very, very few things in it. You know, I just said, for humans, the family hominidae only contains one thing. Um, for other species, a family might have more than one. Um, genus or species in it. Okay, so like I said a minute ago, phylogenetic trees or cladograms are a hypothesis. They're a, a, a guess, educated guess, as to how species are related. And I wanna, I wanna look at this one and just kind of ask you some questions about it to make sure that you understand how, how to read these. Um, so first off, if I said, where is the common ancestor of all of the current species? It's right here, all right? It doesn't have a name. Where you have a fork, those are called nodes. So this thing is the ancestor of leopards, American badgers, European otters, coyotes, and gray wolves, all right? Um, if I said which two species of, of the five extant living species are the closest related, it would be the coyote and the gray wolf. And the reason is they have the most recent common ancestor. Sometimes on AP essays, they'll ask like a question like that, and it's worth two points. You get a point for answering and a point for answering why. And the question I ask will be worth two points. The answer is coyotes and gray wolves. And the answer is because they have the most recent common ancestor. Those are two super easy points that you could answer in one sentence. Um, what two species are the least related? Well, it's a gray wolf and a leopard because they have the most distant common ancestor. If I said, which, which pair are closer related? American badger and European otter, are these two closer related? Or the coyote and the gray wolf, or are these two closer related? Um, they're right next to each other in both cases. 
the answer is these two are the most closely related because they have a more recent common ancestor. Or you could say because the badger and the otter have a more distant common ancestor. So this next slide shows some vocabulary. And to be honest, these vocabulary words are best explained by looking at a diagram. If you're, if you're copying out the lecture outline right now, let's just, just go through this quickly, then we'll look at them on, on a diagram. So words that describe things on cladograms. So a branch point represents the divergence of two taxa from a common ancestor. Sister taxa are groups that share an immediate common ancestor. A rooted tree means it includes a branch to represent the most recent common ancestor of all the taxa on the tree. A basal taxon diverges early in the history of a group and originates near the common ancestor of that group. And a polytomy is a branch from which there are more than two groups. So let's look at those words on a diagram. So first off, on this cladogram, this is my ancestor, right? Um, is this tree rooted? Well, a rooted tree, again, means it includes the common ancestor for all the taxa. Is this the common ancestor for all the taxa on the tree? Yes, it is. So is this tree rooted? Yes. The basal taxon would be taxon G because it's the one that branched off closest to the common ancestor. Um, the basal taxon could be at the bottom. It could also be at the top of the tree. It'd be weird for it to be in the middle, um, but it's usually the top one or the bottom. It's the one that branched off the soonest. Um, let's see, sister taxa just means they have a, a very recent common ancestor, so B and C are, are sister taxa. The polytomy means that you have more than two things that come off. When it says unresolved, that means like these three are more resolved because I know that B and C are closer related than A and B or A and C. Here between D, E, and F, I don't know which one's more closely related to each other, so I just have all three coming from five at the same point. Um, Cool. So in chapter 19, we, we mentioned analogy and homology briefly. So remember, homology was when you had structures that were, were, were different in function, like this picture here, but had similar structures. And those in, infer common ancestry. So homology is useful. Remember, we said analogy was not useful. These are two, oh, I forget what they are. They're two, two mole type creatures, things that burrow in the ground. One's in North America and one is I want to say in Asia, maybe it's Australia. I forget. It's in the book. They're they're not. They live on opposite sides of the planet. So the common ancestor, a recent common ancestor, no. They've evolved to look similar due to convergent evolution, which is when the the, the pressure of natural selection you know pushes them to evolve in similar ways because of the environment. So analogy is not useful for shared ancestry, but homology is. Um, an example. So bat and bird wings, bats and, bats and birds are, are related. Um, they're homologous as forelimbs in that the structure, like the bone structure or the bat's wing structure, the internal structure is similar, um, but they're analogous as functional wings. Bird wings are made of feathers. The outside, the bat wing is like a, a membrane stretched um, over the bones. So like, you know, it, it depends, they, they function differently on the outside, but the, the structure, the forelimb structure is homologous. Um, and one way to tell the difference is things that are really complex that are similar, it's like it would be harder for random chance to explain that, right? So if you have lots of complexity and the structures are similar, they're probably homologous. If they're similar, but they're not, they're, they're very simple structures, um, then they're probably analogous. So a molecular homology, so this is interesting. You can, you would probably want to use a computer to do this. So say that I have a gene, or I'm, I'm comparing two genes, and those two genes are each 5 million bases long. They're really, really long genes, complicated. They do totally different things. But say 5% of those two genes are identical. And say the 5% is in the same section of the genes. Uh, that kind of indicates that maybe those two genes had a common ancestor, an ancestral gene. Look at these two sequences. These are obviously only 20 or 25 bases. They have very little in common, but the ones that are in common are in the same place, and here there's two paired together. So a molecular homology, molecular just means you're looking at either DNA sequences or protein sequences, or when you have regions that are, that are similar, um, like specifically similar in the same place, which probably indicates they came from the same ancestral gene. 
this life in the book just shows here I have two sequences. Um, at first, they were identical. All I did is I, I deleted that one and I inserted a, some stuff there and, then, and copied it. And you wound up with two sequences that are that have differences, but there are whole segments that are similar. Okay, so how do you construct these uh, phylogenetic trees? So these words, monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic, this is stuff, just FYI, I never learned this in school. This is, this is since I was an AP bio, so I had to teach this to myself, um, which was super fun. And it took, it took me like, I don't know, three or four readings to be like, what are they talking about? What are these words? So if you don't quite get this the first run through, it's okay, you just spend some time with it. So a clade just means you have a group of species that includes the ancestor and all of its descendants. So look at this picture right here. This is called a monophylactic group. I have the common ancestor, one, and I have all of its descendants. That's a monophylactic group, or you can use the word clade. All right, a paraphylactic group, so look at the difference here. I have the common ancestor, right? But I don't have all of the descendants. I'm leaving out G. So this is a paraphylactic grouping. A polyphylactic grouping has the common ancestor of A, B, and C, but then it has descendants from a different common ancestor. So the way this is shown, the, the blue highlighted part is called a polyphylactic group. So mono, common ancestor, all the descendants. Para, common ancestor, but you're missing descendants. Poly, common ancestor, but you have too many descendants. You have descendants from a different common ancestor. If I, if, if in diagram C, if I had highlighted the whole thing, it'd be monophyletic, okay? This, these next couple slides just go through what I just said. If you need to pause it and write stuff down, feel free. Monophyletic, polyphyletic, and paraphyletic, all right? And this just compares them all. Okay, so this can be confusing, but it's, it's, it's not, but it can be confusing. So to make the trees, there's, there's two kinds of, of characters we're looking at. There's what's called a shared ancestral character and what are called shared derived characters. A shared ancestral character is a, a feature. Character just means like, do you have two eyes? Do you have a backbone? Do you have legs? Do you, you know, have hemoglobin? It's just a, a trait. A shared ancestral character is a trait that everything has because it was in the common ancestor. A shared derived trait is a trait that developed after that group diverged from the common ancestor. And the diagram I have here, um, has both examples. So first off, on this diagram, um, what would be the out group? So the out group would be the lancelet, right? Oh, it's, it's labeled out group because it's the one that diverged closer to the common ancestor, right? Um, so look at from, from lamprey to leopard. Let's just forget lancelet for right now. Lamprey through um, bass, frog, turtle, leopard. So if I said, let me ask you a question. If I said, give me a shared ancestral character for um, bass, frog, turtle, and leopard. Give me a shared ancestral character. Um, actually, a little stupid for all of them, but Lancelot. Give me a shared ancestral character for the lamprey through the leopard, something all of them have because the common ancestor had it. It'd be the vertebral col column, it'd be backbone, right? Because that appeared here, and so all of them have it. If I said, give me a um, shared derived character for the turtle and the leopard, all right, that would be something that they have that the ancestor didn't have. So that would be like the amion, all right? Um, and I, when I ask the question, I just tell you what ancestor we're looking at. So let me ask the question again. So give me a shared derived character for turtle and leopard, um, and I'm showing you this bottom half that includes the frog. All right, if I include all three, a shared ancestral character would be four walking legs. If I'm giving you these three, a shared derived character for turtle and leopard would be having amion, um, which just means like uh, amniotic egg, um, or like the, the amniotic sac for a, um, a, a mammal like caimans or leopards, okay? So shared derived traits happen after the group diverged shared ancestral traits the ancestor had. And if you think about it, you know, you need both. The shared derived character is, is kind of better because like, how do I know where to put bass, frog, turtle, and leopard? 
because I know what traits they derived after they branched off. This shows a chart of the four um, or the five traits in the species. And on the AP exam, sometimes they'll give you a chart like this and give you the cladogram where it's blank and you have to fill in where each species goes. All right. So like, how do you know what the out group is? Well, the out group is the lane select because it doesn't have anything in common with the other ones, right? So it diverged first. Um, four of them have the vertebral column, right? I'm sorry, five of them have the, have the vertebral column. I, I can't read or I can't count. So like those five would be here, all right? Um, four of them have hinge jaws. So the hinge jaws appeared here because the four descendants have it. Only one of them has hair, right? Um, which would be the leopard, okay? So think of it like the lancelet doesn't have anything, any of the, of the traits. The leopard um, has all of the traits. So it's at the bottom or the most diverse. In class, we're gonna do a ton of practice with these. The AP exam loves to ask these. So if this doesn't quite make sense yet, it, it'll be okay. But being able to go from a chart like this to a diagram like this is super important. Okay, so on this slide, what we've already discussed is the out group again is a species that is closely related to the in group, the group of species being studied. So here, the species we're looking at are the lamprey through the leopard. The out group would be the lancelet. Okay, so the concept of maximum parsimony. So this this can get really tricky, but it's again this is a decently simple concept. So Let's just do an example real quick. So here I have three species of bird, right? One, two, and three. And there's three possible phylogenetic trees. Either I have one and two together, one and three together, or two and three together. And I'm gonna give you some DNA data to figure out which, which of these um, is, is correct. So the ancestral species, which again, like that's the ancestor, that's the ancestor, that's the ancestor, has this DNA sequence, AGTT, and I've given you for those four sites what the sequence is for the three current living species. So just look at the table and can you figure out which of these two species are the closer or the closest related between one, two, and three? So like species one and two have two letters in common. Species two and three have one letter in common, one site. Species one and three has one site. So species one and two are the closer related, which makes this first tree the one that's correct. Okay, that logic should make sense to you. Um, the way, I'm skipping the slide for right now, I'll come back to it. The way that the, the book has us judge, you know, which tree is correct, is to do, a, to do an, an activity like this. And I, if you have the outline, you have this in front of you blank, so just do what I tell you to do as I explain it. So the ancestral species in site one has an A. It's changed to a C in species one and species two. So for each of these three charts, I want you to put a mark where that change had to happen. So it changed for species one and two. If I put a mark right here, just like take a pencil, put a mark right there, that means a change happened, they got to one and two. For it to be here, I'd have to put a mark here and put a mark here to hit one and two. For this tree, I had to put a mark here and put a mark here to get to one and two, okay? Site two, the ancestor had a G, it changed again for one and two. So put a second mark here, put a mark there and a mark there, mark by that one and a mark by that two, all right? For site three, it changed in one and three. So I need to put a mark here and a mark here. Now for this cladogram, I could just put a mark there for site three. For here, I had to put one here and then one here. Um, for site four, it changed in species two and three. So for this tree, I put one here and one down here. This tree put one here and one here. For this tree, I could just put one right here for two and three because it would hit both of them. And if you look, look back at what the book did, they've got each mark labeled with what site and what letter it happened. But yours should look just like this, right? where I have six marks here, seven there, and seven there. So you should understand how I take the sequence data and how I make the different marks and then pick the tree that has the fewest number of marks. Um, this just shows that, that larger, okay? Same thing. Um, a case study, an example. 
So you've probably heard before that we, we think that the dinosaurs are very closely related to birds. So birds, dinosaurs, and, and reptiles, current reptiles, if you put them on a phylogenetic tree, so birds and, and crocodiles share traits like a four-chambered heart, they have different songs, they sit on nests, they brood, which there's evidence dinosaurs did that too. So if you look at the common ancestor of crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds, of course dinosaurs are extinct, so they shouldn't go to the present, but whatever. Um, we, we group them together because they have traits that lizards and snakes don't necessarily have. Um, evidence, this is a crocodile sitting on a nest. Um, this is a pretty cool dinosaur fossil. You can see um, there's eggs. I guess this dinosaur died sitting on the nest. She, I guess, she sacrificed herself, I suppose, for eggs that never hatched. That's kind of sad. Um, but there's the eggs. Here you can see the dinosaur um, sitting on it. Um, so we, you know, we link dinosaurs with birds due to their shared derived traits. Okay, so we're going to end this chapter um, with this idea of, of um, molecular clocks, and this is a very important concept, and this is super relevant um, in modern biology. So a molecular clock is, let me ask you a question. Do you think that, so you know, DNA mutates all the time. Polymerase makes mistakes, UV radiation can mutate DNA, DNA mutates. Do you think the rate of mutation is something that's constant over the course of the history of life on Earth? The answer is probably not, all right? There are times when there's more or less UV radiation. The mutation rate can change over long periods of time. But under shorter chunks of time, I mean by shorter, which we're still talking about millions of years, um, the mutation rate of DNA is decently constant enough to where that I could figure out when two species diverged by comparing the number of mutations that they have compared to one another. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I have two species and I'm comparing and I sequence the DNA and I'm just gonna make up numbers. These numbers are, are gonna be silly, but just go with it. And those two species have a hundred mutations. Like if I, if I compare them, there's a hundred differences in the A's, T's, G's, and C's. If I know that DNA mutates on average um, one time a year, I can assume that they diverged 100 years ago from a common ancestor. And you can see this, this little graph here shows divergence time, number of mutations. Obviously, you know, as time goes on, you build up mutations. It's very unlikely you'd have a mutation that undid a previous mutation. I guess that's possible, but that's super unlikely. We're talking about billions of, of bases, right? So you, you accumulate mutations um, as time goes on. And you, know, you can look at this little red line of best fit. You can tell um, a, as you go back in time, um, you're getting fewer mutations. The zero point would be when, when two species diverge. So here we're going forward in time. Um, in this case, the present would be 120 million years after, after divergence. Now, I want to go through a couple examples of molecular clocks because this is super cool and it's super relevant. So let's talk about HIV. So HIV is a virus, the virus that causes AIDS. Um, and people are, are pretty sure that HIV, well, we know that it first originated in, in chimps and other primates. And at some point, the virus mutated to where it could infect humans. Um, it's likely maybe a monkey bit a human at some point and transferred the virus to the human, but the, the virus would have to mutate for it to be able to infect host cells of the human. So the question is, when did that happen? Um, the first you know, AIDS cases that really made the news big time were in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but the question was, when did the virus actually go from chimps to humans? And if you look at this graph, and, and HIV mutates at a pretty steady rate. Um, here I have each of these dots represents uh, a person that had HIV. They took the, the virus, they sequenced the genome and compared the letters. And you can see, you know, the, all the dots are in the 80s, 90s to 2000. That's when we had patients. Uh, but as you go back in time, you're, there's, there's less dissimilarity between the strains. Do a line of best fit and you can tell it seems like the virus, you know, the virus went from chimps to humans once. I guess it could have gone more than once, but it was probably once. And then that ancestral strain has become all the strains that we have today. And that would have happened in the 1930s. Um, and actually there was records, it's probably pretty interesting, of people dying of, people are thought it was some kind of cancer. They didn't know that it was a virus. They didn't know that it was AIDS. Um, that those people were probably dying of HIV. 
um, but people didn't, didn't know what it was. But this is re really, really cool because you can date when the virus originated or when it moved from one, one species to another. Another example of this, which is very relevant today, is looking at COVID-19. Um, the data I want to show you, um, just for full disclosure, I'm making this video on July 22nd, 2020. So the data that I'm showing you, it, you know, tomorrow will be out of date. Um, but it shows how the virus has spread over just really a handful of months. So this is a pretty cool graph. Um, I want to actually click, click the link and go to it. I know you can't do this, but I can. Um, and I want to read, so I'm just going to skip ahead and read a, a one paragraph for you. So the team's analytic approach relies on tracking how viruses mutate over time as they spread from person to person. In the case of the coronavirus, whose RNA consists of about 30,000 genetic bases or letters, it mutates about twice a month. These minor mutations tend not to change the potency of the virus, but they provide clues for genetic detectives to chart how they shift suddenly over time, allowing them to create sprawling family trees or phylogenies, that word actually exists, I didn't make it up, that show how the coronavirus has spread from one part of the world or country to the next. And if I, if I make this bigger, um, like you can see this goes from December 3rd, 2019 up to March 11th, 2020. Um, so this is actually a bit out of date from when I'm making the video, but the, the colors represent where the, where the patient was. So each dot represents a patient that had COVID-19 and they sequenced the DNA. Um, the color represents where it was, like the blue, I think is Asia. I think North America might be the red, I was on a previous slide. Um, the yellow might be Africa, I don't remember. But, um, but what they do is they, they group by similarities in nucleotide sequence, the, the different strains, and I, I shouldn't use the word strains, to have a different strain would have to be like a different potency or a different, something different about it. H having one letter difference, I'm not sure you'd call that a different strain, you just call it a different variant maybe. Um, and as you go forward in time, you can see how the virus is mutated to where you get different variants. And you can see that it, you know, looking at this, the, the first patient would represent or well, the oldest patient would represent oldest as an infection time, probably Wuhan, China, the prior patient that had it there. And you can see how the early cases, the purple or blues are, are in Asia, but you can see how the virus spreads. Um, I also wanna show you another cool one. So this one, this shows a map um, of the virus spread across the world. And in a minute, I'm, I wanna go to the link because I can show this for January, February, and March. But you can see how the virus originated, obviously, in China. And then you can see where it spread. Of course, you know, like, going back, these are, the x-axis here is time. So you know that, you know, these patients had it in January. These patients had it in March. So their infection rate is, or the, the infection date is later. So you can see how the virus actually spreads. And you can see um, the virus is spreading to Australia. You can see it spreading to Europe. That's, that's the purple. You can see here it spread to United States, this circle doesn't, they weren't all going to Nebraska, like they just have a center, a circle in the center of the country. Um, but you can see that like the US got the virus from China, they also got it from Europe. So like, you know, the idea early on when the pandemic first started, we banned travel from China, which that, that's fine, because obviously the virus came from China, but the virus also came from Europe, um, through, you know, from China through Europe. So not like, not banning travel from Europe early on, well, the virus still got to the U.S. because it came from Europe. And especially people that had it in, in New York, the very first really big outbreak in New York, those people largely got it from carriers who came from Europe, not from China. Um, you can tell just by sequence the DNA and see, or it's an RNA virus, sequence the RNA and see which strain it's most similar to. If I click on this link, this is really cool. Um, Let's see, here, here, here's January, here's February, here's March, and you can see how always the virus is spreading very, very rapidly, but you can tell where it's coming from and how it's spreading. Um, see the circle for China gets smaller, for the US it gets bigger. Um, it's really, really cool. So, and basically you're, you're using molecular clocks, you're using mutation rates to see which, which variant of the virus that you have and where it came from. Um, the last one I want to show you, this is highlighted on North America. I'm going to actually go to the link. 
this website, nextstrain.org, is like a epidemiologist dream. It shows data for lots of diseases, not just COVID-19. I just have it, the link went to the pressure code. You, you can trace the flu, you can trace Ebola. People can upload data, it's super cool. This data goes up through July the 2nd, so it's a little more up-to-date than what I showed you. But like, you know, these patients, each dot represents a patient. Um, and the colors, like I can, I can highlight. So that patient right there is in Wisconsin. Let's see where it says, Wisconsin. This patient here was in Florida. This patient here was in Florida. This one was in 98% Asia. So I guess you can assume that's Asian. But um, what I want to do is when I hit play on this little animation, like when I hit play, you see how it's it's going through time up here. When I scroll down, you can see, I'll just let it go for a second. You can see where, where the case is. See, so here you see in California and Seattle. Here they're coming to New York. The New York ones came from Europe. Um, can you see time right now? Right now I can't show you time. I have to scroll this to show time. But you can see where the cases are coming from by tracking the, the genome of, of the virus. By the end, it's it's kind of scary because like the whole country is just lit up. And of course, the colors are representing where the virus is coming from. And if I go up again, you can see, gosh, we're we're only in February or March on um, the animation. Let me just let it go for a second. Anyway, that's that's pretty cool. A little scary, but cool too. But this is doing phylogeny, doing cladistics, using molecular clocks with a virus that's, you know, happening right now in, in real time. Okay, so enough about COVID. So a couple of things just really quick. So um, usually you compare species by comparing their DNA or their RNA if, they're, if it's an RNA virus. Um, you know, Linnaeus had two kingdoms, plant, animal. Today we actually have six. When I was in school, we taught five. The five that we taught, or that I was taught, were Monera, which are bacteria, protists, plants, fungi, and animals. Um, today we have six. Basically, we took kingdom Monera and split into two separate kingdoms. There's so much variety of bacteria that they weren't two separate kingdoms. Then we added the domain. So bacteria is a kingdom or a domain just for certain kinds of prokaryotes. Archaea, you know, when I was in school, we would just call bacteria, and we called all bacteria. Archaea are certain types of prokaryotes, and eukarya would be the domain for eukaryotic cells like plants, animals, fungi, and protists. Um, everything in bacteria and archaea are single cell prokaryotes. We'll come back to this in a, a chapter later. This just shows the uh, cladogram for life. Um, where are you? You are right here. So, what, what's, what's, what kingdom is the closest kingdom related to animals? You'd say fungi, because they have a more recent common ancestor. Um, and the last thing I want to say, we, we're going to end on a, a, well, whatever. So we've been talking about what's called vertical gene transfer, which is passing on genes from parent to offspring through descendants, right? That's what we're talking about is de descendants. Well, there's this thing called horizontal gene transfer, which throws a wrench in all of this. This is when you move genes from one person or one plant or one individual to another that are not related. It's not parent to child, it's from person to person, like horizontally. There's many ways this can happen. Um, I mean, viruses do this. Viruses take genes from a virus to a person. That, you know, the virus, I didn't give birth to the virus. A virus can actually transfer genes from one person to another. If a virus infects me and, you know, I make a billion viruses, maybe one of those viruses package one of my genes by accident. If that virus goes and infects one of you, then you have DNA for me, all right? That can happen. That's called horizontal gene transfer. It happens in, in plants a lot, too. Um, this, you know, genes transferring that way is not through inheritance, like parent to offspring. So, like, two species can become closer related because they swap genes horizontally, which is, that's not useful for cladistics, um, but it happens, so we need to, to acknowledge that it happens. Okay, so we're going to stop there. That's enough for one chapter. I hope that was helpful, and I will see you guys next time.